All right, welcome to the second video for Accounting 330, Introduction to Income Taxation. Uh, the audio quality wasn't great for the first video. That was because uh, the audio was recorded on the built-in microphone for the webcam. And for this video, I've transferred the audio over to this Bluetooth microphone thing that I have. But unfortunately, the only way to mount this is on the headphones. And because I feel kind of silly just putting headphones on my head when I'm speaking into a webcam and not really listening to anything, I've kind of draped the headphones on my neck. So hopefully we'll have better audio quality for this video. And maybe this is what we do just going forward. Uh, <clears throat> but with this video, we'll be continuing uh, chapter one. You know, in the last video, we talked about some basic terminology like taxes, taxpayers, tax incidents, jurisdiction. We talked about a few different types of taxes. We talked about rate and base, different rate structures. And we also talked about uh, briefly the history of the federal income tax in the United States. Uh, with this class, we're going to be talking about local taxes, state taxes. We're going to talk about federal taxes in a bit more detail. We're going to talk about foreign taxes, and we're also going to talk about where tax law comes from. By the end of this video, you should have enough knowledge uh, to take the first quiz. I will talk about the first quiz at the end of the video. Uh, so without further ado, let's just jump right into uh, the subject matter. So the first of the taxes that we'll be talking about are local taxes. And as the name implies, local taxes are going to be taxes at the local level. And when I say local level, I could be referring to city level, like you know the city of Lawrence has power to implement taxation. Uh, I could be talking about county level or uh, various other local levels. So the city of Lawrence has taxing authority. Douglas County has taxing authority. And for some states, uh, there will be like school district taxes or other sort of local district taxation that might be in play. Uh, but the most common are going to be city level and county level taxes. And for local governments, local level taxes make up about 70% of total revenue. So some local government funding is going to come from the state. Some local government funding is going to come from the federal government. Uh, some local government funding is going to come from fines and fees, which remember we talked about as being very distinct concepts from taxes. Uh, but most local government funding, about 70%, is going to come from taxes that the local governments can implement. And the primary types of local government taxes are going to be Real property taxes, personal property taxes, sales taxes, and very rarely income taxes. So we're going to talk about what real property is and what personal property is in the next set of slides. We already talked about what sale ta sales taxes were, right? These were transaction-based taxes, meaning that they are triggered when a certain transaction takes place, uh, in this case, the sale of a good. And they are flat rate taxes, right? Whether I go to Best Buy and drop $2,000 on a flat screen LED or whether I go to Hy-Vee and drop $100 on groceries, I'm going to be paying the same rate as a sales tax. So it's not a graduated rate that increases with the base. With a sales tax, our base, our base is, is not going to change the rate. So this is a rate that is flat. 
All right. Uh, real property and personal property taxes we're going to start talking about in the next slide. So when I talk about real property, what do I mean? Well, by definition, land and anything affixed to the land erected or growing on the land is real property. Anything under the land is also real property, right? So land right this is our land anything over the land like a house right or some sort of silo or anything under the land like if you might have mineral wealth or oil so your land is real property your house on top of the land is real property. Anything growing on the land, so if you have some sort of agricultural product that is considered real property, or anything under the land, like any subsurface mineral wealth or oil wealth or natural gas, whatever, that is all considered real property. Uh, so yeah, I mean, anything that is essentially affixed to the land or, or stuck under that land is real property. And real property taxes, are levied annually and are based on the assessed value of the real property. So the market value determines the value of the real property. And one caveat here is owners can contest the value. So what I mean is when you pay taxes on your real property, whether it be your house or the oil that you have underneath your land or, you know, whatever else that might be affixed on your land or on the land that is growing or underneath the land as subsurface sort of mineral wealth, uh, the taxes you pay are determined by the market value of the real property. And the market value is determined by a tax assessor that is coming from the, you know, the, the, the taxing body. So if you're paying the taxes to the county, the county has someone come out and assess the value of your house. And this assessment is done each year. So every year you would have someone come out and assess the value of your real property and you would pay taxes based on the value that is assessed. Now you as the owner have a chance to challenge the value that is placed on the property by the tax assessor. So if someone comes by and assesses you know, a $600,000 value to my house, I know that that assessment is way over the actual market value of the house so that I could go back to the county and challenge that valuation and hopefully get the assessment down which would lead me to paying less of a real property tax. So some unique features of real property taxes are that different types of real property are often taxed at different rates or subject to different appraisal techniques. So the way in which the tax assessor would assess value to, let's say, agricultural land versus scenic land won't be the same, right? If you have some scenic land on your property, it's not going to be assessed the same way as agricultural land that is on your property. Your agricultural land might get more favorable treatment from the county. Or if you have commercial land, 
versus residential land. So if your land is zoned to build, you know, businesses on it, the assessment might be different than land that is zoned to build housing on it. Uh, and something that we mentioned on the last slide, tax assessments can change annually. Uh, primarily according to government need. So it might be the case that we have a budget shortfall and in this case the rules surrounding the assessment of certain land types might change, right? The tax assessor coming out to your property might now assess the value of your property according to a different set of rules because we need to raise more money as a county or city government. Uh, conversely, we might have, you know, an abundance of resources, we might have an abundance of money as a local government, and in that case, the rules surrounding the assessment of some of these property types might change to where they're assessed a lower value. But, you know, two things to keep in mind, uh, different types of real property are assessed differently, and these assessments happen annually, and they can be challenged by the owner of the property. So here is a quick example. Uh, this is from you know, 2015, so these values certainly might have changed, but these are the property tax rates by region and value of, you know, the house, essentially. So a house that is located in, you know, New England, if it's in an urban area, you're paying about a 2% tax if your house is worth around 150 thousand dollars and you're paying about 2.17 percent of a tax if your house is valued around three hundred thousand dollars and you know you can just extend this example to where if you're in a rural area once again those tax rates change slightly so as we mentioned in the previous slide the assessment of real property values and the taxes that those real property value the, those real properties are subject to are going to change depending on you know which region we're talking about what type of property we're talking about and even within that region if we're talking about urban versus rural property right so we're located in the midwest and as you can see you know urban real property taxes range from 1.97% to 2.036% uh, and rural taxes range from 1.69% to 1.738%, right? So the assessment changes depending on what type of real property and, you know, the nature of that real property. And as you can see, like here, at least in 2015, the West had the lowest tax rates on real property. Now, generally, we associate the West Coast, you know, California, Washington, Oregon, with high taxes so these low property taxes might be in place to kind of balance the you know the extremely high taxes in other aspects of life other areas of life so this is a more you know detailed i mean a, a more zoomed in example of what we talked about in the previous slide here we're just looking at highest and lowest property taxes for u.s urban cities so the highest taxes for you know houses of about 150,000 Connecticut, Detroit, Michigan, Aurora, Illinois, Newark, New Jersey, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The lowest is going to be Denver, Colorado, Birmingham, Alabama, Washington DC, Honolulu, Hawaii and Boston, Massachusetts. And when we're looking at houses of about $300,000, you don't really see much changes, but when you get to the lower end, you can see that some of those move around, some drop out, some pop back in. Uh, but yeah, overall, annually, if you have you know a house worth three hundred thousand dollars in Bridgeport, Connecticut, you're paying twelve thousand dollars of taxes versus seven hundred sixty-five dollars of taxes for the same type of house in Honolulu, Hawaii. So these tax rates. And assessments are going to change based on, you know, we talked about the needs of Honolulu versus the needs of Bridgeport, Connecticut. 
uh, at the time. So these might have changed since 2015. Uh, I couldn't find updated tables for these, but this is a good example regardless to show kind of the disparity of, of tax rates between regions in the U.S. Because, you know, geographically, New York, New Jersey is not that far away from Bridgeport, Connecticut, but there's like a significant change in the amount of taxes that you'd be paying for a house of similar value. Another unique feature of, of real property and real property taxes is this concept called real property tax abatement. And a tax abatement is a temporary reduction in taxes. Primarily takes place to lure in businesses. Right? So, this is a newspaper article from 2017. It is from the Nevada Appeal. Uh, no, I think it's from the Lahontan Valley News, actually, serving northern Nevada. So, a very credible news source uh, for Nevada. And the title says, Tesla, $37 million in tax credits and a $114 million abatement on their real property taxes. So like we said, property tax abatements generally come into play when we're talking about businesses. And you know, business headquarter relocation decisions or new headquarter opening decisions are very publicized. They're very important for geographic regions because they bring in a lot of business. You know, if you follow any sort of business news when there's you know, talk of headquarters opening or, or headquarters relocating, you'll see different cities or local governments, counties, whatever, submitting bids to these companies, right? I remember a few years ago, like Amazon was considering opening new headquarters and like Irving, Texas was competing with, you know, Washington, D.C. and they were submitting bid packages to Amazon of, of you know, not only talking up the region, in terms of you know schools and quality of life and 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 you know like transportation ease but they also submit different tax incentives in this case tesla got 37 million dollars of tax credits from the state of nevada as well as 114 million dollars in tax abatement so this means that they did not have to pay you know 114 million dollars of their property taxes because of the fact that they constructed that, you know, I think it was a lithium ion battery factory in Nevada. Uh, so yeah, you know, property taxes, as well as other type of taxes are big negotiation tools for local governments when they're trying to bring in uh, businesses. So we talked about uh, in the past few slides, you know, real property. And we said that real property is your land Anything that is on top of your land, whether it's, you know, crops that you have growing on top of your land or a house that you have on top of land or whatever. And also anything that is located under the land, right? If it's oil wealth or natural gas or, you know, you have, a, you know, I don't know, coal deposits, you know, bronze, whatever. All of that is, is, is real property. All of that is assessed yearly by a tax assessor and all of that you pay taxes on on a yearly basis based on the assessment. So personal property is any asset that is not considered to be real property. So essentially this is the other side of that coin. Uh, so anything that is not land, affixed on top of the land, or, you know, stuck underneath the land, is considered personal property. And much like real property, taxes on personal property... are based on the value of the asset. However, 
the valuation of these assets is self-recorded and reported. There is no government assessor. So anything that we have like household tangible assets, you know, automobiles, boats, furniture, business tangible assets, you know, equipment, inventory, furniture. Uh, these all are examples of personal property. And since we're talking about any asset that is not considered real property intangibles, such as stocks and bonds, are also falling under the category of personal property. So real property is very easy to define, right? Land, anything above the land, anything below the land is real property. Anything that is not real property is considered to be personal property. And much like personal, I mean, much like real property, we should, as taxpayers, be paying taxes on our real property annually. But we're not paying taxes on our real property annually. And part of that has to do with the fact that the valuation of these assets is self-recorded and self-reported. There is no government tax assessor coming by to check the value of your automobiles, to check the value of your boats, if you have any, your furniture. You know, there's no government assessor going to businesses individually and checking the value of the furniture there or the inventory or the equipment. And no one is coming by your house to check on your Robinhood profile to see which stocks you've invested in. All of this should be self-reported and self-recorded. And, you know, part of the reason, it's actually a great transition into this next slide, personal property taxes are becoming less relevant for local tax revenue. Why is that? Well... One, these taxes are difficult to enforce because of the self-reporting nature, right? And two, searching uh, or let's not say that, two tax assessors could violate personal privacy and three mobility. So we're going to talk about all these. One, these types of taxes are becoming less relevant because, as I said when I was talking about the previous slide, we need to self-report the value. And none of us is going to you know, the DMV every year to say, hey, our car, we bought it for this much, it's depreciated this much, so the value of my car this year is X amount, so I should pay this tax on my car of this amount. None of us is doing that. And if you consider, you know, okay, a car, it might be easy, but, you know, even in our house, we have hundreds of pieces of personal property that we would need to self-report uh, to the government authority to pay a tax on. And it's going to be very cumbersome. Uh, you know, it's just not feasible to do. Like you would have to, you know, go and report the value of your PC or your Xbox or your TV or, you know, the treadmill that you have in your house, your set of dumbbells, whatever you have, you would have to report those values every year and then pay a tax on those items according to the valuation that you report every year. And it's just not feasible to do. Uh, the second point is we have this self-reporting because there are no tax assessors coming by the house to check the value of these assets. 
or the presence of these assets, right? Uh, if a tax assessor were to come into my house, it would be a grave violation of my privacy, right? I mean, just walking, he'd be walking through all my rooms or she'd be walking through all my rooms, you know, with a list, checking every single asset that I have in the house, assessing evaluation to it. Uh, even if it's a business, right? You would walk into a business all around the facility, looking at furniture, looking at equipment, looking at inventory, it would be a gross violation of privacy. So once again, it's not feasible to do. And the third point is mobility. It is not easy for you, or maybe it might even be impossible, depending on the type of real property, but it is not easy for you to move real property around, right? I can't just lift up the house, hide it from the tax assessor, take it somewhere else. I can't just hide the mineral wealth under the land that I have from the tax assessor. But with some personal property, mobility is a big issue, right? If I'm talking about smaller items, extremely easy to hide them. Even if I'm talking about some intangibles like stocks and bonds, extremely easy to hide them, right? So due to these three reasons, these types of taxes are becoming less relevant. Uh, governments, local governments are depending more on real property taxes than personal property taxes. And to kind of combat the decreased relevance of personal property taxes, governments are resorting to, so local governments are resorting to uh, fees for licensing certain types of personal property, right? So I don't have to report the value of my car every year to the tax authority and pay a tax on that assessed value of my car, but I do have to pay a registration fee every year to the state of Kansas in order to drive my car. If I don't pay that registration fee and I'm driving my car, it's very easy for me to be identified by law enforcement and then, you know, I get some sort of a punishment. Uh, so to kind of combat the decreased relevance of personal property in, in you know, generating tax revenue, certain types of personal property have now been subjected to, you know, licensing fees, registration fees, so on and so forth. Uh, so, you know, we talked about different types of local taxes. We said personal property taxes and, you know, real property taxes were the most common. Certainly, personal property taxes are becoming less relevant. We already talked about sales taxes, and we said that in very rare instances, right, uh, some local governments implemented sales taxes, I mean, income taxes. Uh, so some cities and counties do levy income taxes. Uh, as you can see, you know, there are county income taxes in Indiana and Maryland. We don't have a county income tax here. But there are also city income taxes in various cities across the United States. So, in fact, Kansas City has a 1% income tax. St. Louis, Missouri, which is a few hours away, has a 1% income tax. Washington, D.C. has a 4 to 8.5% city income tax. You know, Philadelphia, New York, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, Detroit. So, these are all cities that have fairly high income tax rates. Uh, Denver has, you know, a fixed income tax rate of $5 per month if you earn anything above $500. Now, you know, this stuff, it becomes relevant when you are graduating and you are potentially thinking about a location to get a job in, right? Uh, you know, I mean, if you have two offers, one from DC, one from Pittsburgh, or one from Philadelphia, one from Pittsburgh, you know, these are both in the state of Pennsylvania, similarly sized cities. You know, I mean, that 1% income tax difference might not be the ultimate decider for you, but it might come into your decision process, right? I mean, why would you choose to live in a place where you're paying an 8.5% income tax rate when you can live in a place where you have a 4% income tax rate just at the city level, right? I mean... You know, if you're deciding between D.C. and New York, that's a pretty large gap. 
uh, like we said, some counties have income taxes and some other, you know, in the in a few slides ago, in a few slides back, we talked about how some other local governments, local jurisdictions also had taxes in place. And one example is school districts. So in Iowa and Ohio, school districts also levy income taxes. And this ties back into that jurisdiction concept that we talked about in the first class, right? Uh, because of your physical connection to these you know local governments they have jurisdiction over you and they are levying taxes on you to in order to help them fund their operation uh, so up to this point we've talked about local taxes which were taxes levied by city governments county governments uh, sometimes school districts and you know maybe some other miscellaneous local governing bodies as well uh, because of the you know connection that we have uh, physical connection by you know being residents in these local governments they have jurisdiction over us so they're able to levy taxes uh, now we're going to be talking about state taxes and when we say state taxes we are primarily talking about two types of taxes that generate revenue for states one is a state income tax which is definitely much more common than a local income tax you know in the last slide we talked about how certain cities have income taxes how certain counties have income taxes and even how school districts might have income taxes uh, when we are at the state level an income tax is much more common uh, quite a few states have a state level income tax and then we also have state consumption taxes and there are a few types of state consumption taxes that we will talk about. There is a sales tax, which we already briefly touched on. There is a use tax. And there is also what is known as an excise tax. So let's start with a sales tax. Uh, most states... Uh, you know, all of them except for the five that are listed on this slide, Alaska, Delaware, Montana, New Hampshire, and Oregon, impose a sales tax. And the sales tax is going to be based on the retail price of tangible goods. Uh, so generally it is going to be levied on you know items that are not necessities so most states do not have a sales tax on drugs you know over the counter or prescription medication most states do not have a sales tax on food uh, you've probably heard of sales tax holidays on school items right so back to school shopping there will be sales tax holidays on you know notebooks pencils backpacks whatever uh, so the sales tax is based on the retail price of the tangible good that you're purchasing uh, it is generally for non-essential items and also it is generally collected so it is collected at the point of sale right meaning that you as the consumer pay the sales tax at the point of sale to the cashier that is checking you out uh, you know when you go to uh, uh, you, you know when you go to Hy-Vee to buy your groceries or when you go to Best Buy to buy a laptop you have the listed price of that tangible good that you're purchasing and then when you go to the cash register they add on whatever the sales tax rate is for your good and you as the consumer are charged with paying that tax so you pay it to the person who is you know, or the business that is selling you the good the business is then collecting all of those sales taxes and then remitting it back to the government on your behalf so you don't go and pay your sales tax directly to the government uh, most states will allow local jurisdiction to impose a sales tax so 
You can see, you know, even though we're about 45 minutes away from Overland Park, Texas, here in Lawrence, I mean Overland Park, Kansas, here in Lawrence, Kansas, our sales tax rate is going to be slightly different, right? So we have a state of Kansas sales tax of 6.5%, which is applicable to both cities. Then we have a county level sales tax, which differs, right? So Johnson County has a higher sales tax than Douglas County. And the city of Lawrence also has a lower sales tax in place than the city of Overland Park. So when we add up all these sales tax rates together, we get, you know, 9.3% in Lawrence, Kansas versus 9.61% in Overland Park, Kansas. And if you're buying, you know, a good that is worth $100, it's only going to differ by about 30 cents. But as the price of your good scales up, even this minute difference in percentages could make, you know, a sizable difference. Like if you buy something that's worth $1,000, it's going to be a $3 difference. It's going to be a $30 difference at $10,000 and so on and so forth. So, you know, the fact that states will allow local jurisdictions to impose sales taxes means that each local jurisdiction will impose a tax rate based on their needs at the time. So how high are sales taxes across the U.S., right? We said that there are five states that don't impose a sales tax, but aside from that, all states do have a certain sales tax. And as you can see, on average, our state level sales tax in the state of Kansas are fairly high. We're number eight, right? So I moved from Texas, which is number 13. Uh, the highest average sales tax is in Tennessee. It's 9.53%. And, you know, the lowest might be Wyoming, I, I think. I don't know if there's any one lower than Wyoming. Well, Alaska. There you go. Alaska is 46 right with 1.76 percent so all states might have a say you know have a sales tax essentially aside from the few that we mentioned in the previous slide and all states give their local governmental bodies authority to levy differing sales taxes so it might be the case that a lot of cities and counties in alaska don't implement a sales tax which is why their average sales tax might be so low Whereas in Tennessee, all cities and counties might have the authority to levy taxes, and they utilize that authority to levy fairly high tax rates, which is why Tennessee's sales tax rate on average might be a bit higher than the rest of the nation. But, you know, this is from 2020, so it's fairly updated. And you can see that, you know, there's a wide range of the amount of taxes that an individual might end up paying, depending on where they live. So the counterpart to a sales tax is a use tax. Now, we said a sales tax was triggered at the point of sale. So, you know, if you go to Foot Locker and buy some Adidas Ultra Boost shoes, at the point of sale, you're going to pay taxes on those shoes, depending on where you're actually buying the shoes. But a use tax is kind of the counter to the sales tax. Every state with a sales tax has a complementary use tax, right? And a use tax is a tax on the ownership, possession, or consumption of tangible goods within a state. Now the next part is key, the use tax only applies when a sales tax was not paid. So this part is key, and I'm going to explain what I mean by this part exactly. Uh, so 
if you go back to this picture, right, let's erase these markups, you can see that there are a variety of differing sales taxes across the US, right? And some of these are in extremely close border regions. Like if you live on the border of Illinois and Missouri, you have an option of buying something from Illinois and paying a 9.08% sales tax or buying something from Missouri and paying a, you know, 8.18% sales tax. Or if you live on the border of Louisiana and Mississippi, you could pay the number two highest tax rate in the nation, or you could pay the number 22 highest tax rate in the nation, right? So there's this big discrepancy. So if you're living close enough to Mississippi that you could easily just drive into Mississippi and buy all your goods and pay a lower sales tax, then what's going to stop you from purchasing all your goods from Mississippi? right if it's a convenient enough drive well technically the use tax should be stopping you from you know just doing this so let's say that there's two states right this is state x and this is state y and state y has a 1% sales tax and state x has a 10% sales tax Right, and if you're living close enough to state Y where you could just drive over to state Y and do all your shopping in state Y, then what would stop you from doing that? Because if you're buying a hundred dollars worth of goods, you know, in state X you would be paying hundred and ten dollars with the sales tax, whereas in state Y you'd be paying hundred and one dollars, right? So you're benefiting from state Y's sales tax rate when you're in fact a resident of state X. <laughs> The use tax is supposed to stop you from doing this. If you drive over to state Y to buy something that is worth $100 and you pay $101, when you come back in to state X, because you would have paid $110 for that same good, that extra $9 you are supposed to pay back to state X as a use tax to make up for the difference in the sales tax that you essentially you know benefited from and this is to help kind of balance out the situation in state X's favor now the problem with this is it is very difficult to enforce like how many of us have paid a use tax none of us we're all use tax avoiders right because no one is gonna go and buy something from you know Kansas City Kansas City Missouri and then come back to Kansas City Kansas and pay the difference in the sales tax. Like no one does that. So it is very difficult to enforce, but the purpose essentially is to level the playing field for businesses, right? I mean, you can see Missouri has an 8.18% sales tax. Kansas, Kansas has an 8.68% sales tax. So if you live in Kansas City, you could just drive one street down and pay less on the goods that you purchase from high V. And if you do this all the time over the course of multiple years, it's going to rack up to you know sales taxes that you've avoided technically uh, if you live on the Kansas side of Kansas City. So in order to prevent this, you should technically be paying a use tax to Kansas City, but no one pays this because it's stupid to do. It's very inconvenient, right? Like no one's going to report, okay, I bought you know this many eggs, this many pounds of, you know, apples or strawberries or onions or potatoes, whatever, and report it to the taxing authority of Kansas each time you buy something. And so it's just, it's stupid, uh, but, you know, it is a tax that we are essentially evading. And if the government decided to crack down on this, I don't even know how they would do it because once again, there's that issue of privacy, right? Like, are they going to send someone to your house? that's going to trail you around to make sure you're stop shopping within the state of Kansas. I don't know. So it's one of those taxes that is that is stupid that we technically should be paying, but it's just because it's so hard to enforce it doesn't get paid. But essentially every state that has a use sales tax has a use tax in order to level the playing field for businesses between low tax and high tax jurisdictions. So here's an example hopefully that uh, you know will help us kind of grasp this concept 
of a sales tax versus a use tax. So John Snow, who lives in Winterfell, purchased a pair of Adidas Ultra Boost shoes for $100. Uh, what does his sales and or use tax do under the following scenarios? And you can kind of pause the video, flip through the next few slides and solve the questions and come back to see if we've got the same answer. Uh, but I'm just going to go through these really quickly. So the key is Jon Snow lives in Winterfell, right? So he should be paying Winterfell sales tax when he buys these shoes. He purchased these in Winterfell. Well, the sales tax is 8.5%. So we have $100 pair of shoes. The sales tax is 8.5%, meaning that the total that he pays is going to be 108.50. So this $8.50 is going to be a sales tax for Jon Snow, right? He lives in Winterfell, he buys the shoes in Winterfell. Winterfell has an 8.5% sales tax, so he's paying $8.50 as a sales tax because he lives in Winterfell and he purchased the shoes in Winterfell. So he purchased the shoes online, right? He went to Amazon.com, bought the shoes, and you know, Amazon doesn't have an agreement with Westeros where they are charging sales tax, right? Back in the day here in the US, Amazon didn't charge any sales tax anywhere because they claimed that they had no connection with some of the areas that they were doing business in, so they would charge no sales tax. So a lot of the states challenged Amazon on this and said, no, you know, you sell to the customers who are living in our area, so you have some sort of economic presence in these areas, therefore you are subject to our jurisdiction. So now when you order from Amazon, it adds a sales tax on top of your order. But let's say there's not a similar understanding between Amazon and Westeros. So there is no sales tax applied to purchases. So he just buys these shoes for a hundred bucks, right? And there is no sales tax. But if he had bought these shoes, right, this is from Amazon. If he had bought these shoes in a store at Westeros, right, he would have been paying 108.50 in Westeros. So since he bought these shoes in Amazon, he didn't pay a sales tax to the businesses operating in Westeros. This $8.50 is going to be a use tax that he needs to report to the tax authority and pay that use tax, right? But he's not going to because it's, you know, it's too cumbersome to do and no one's keeping track of this. So in this example, he purchases it in King's Landing. Remember, Jon Snow lives in Winterfell. He goes to vacation in King's Landing and he decides to cop a pair of Adidas Ultra Boosts. Uh, 100 bucks times 5.5 percent is going to be 105.50 right this is in King's Landing 100 bucks times 8.5 percent we said it was 108.50 this is in Westeros right so the difference 105.50 108.50 is three bucks this is a use tax that Jon Snow needs to report to the Westeros, I mean the Winterfell tax authority, and he needs to pay taxes, use taxes of three dollars for the shoes that he purchased, right? Because he purchased them in King's Landing, but he lives in Winterfell. So this is a use tax that he needs to pay. Now if Jon Snow had paid, you know, like let's say he goes somewhere else, he goes to Highgarden, where the tax rate is nine percent and he pays 109 for the shoes since he would have paid 108.50 for the shoes in winter you know this is high garden this is winterfell since he would have paid 108.50 for the shoes in winterfell and he paid 109 in high garden he doesn't actually owe any use taxes you only owe a use tax when you pay less due to a favorable sales tax compared to the sales tax in the area that you live, 
right? In this example, he has no taxes that are due. But in this example, he has a use tax due because he bought the shoes in King's Landing and he lives in Winterfell, right? And in this example, he owes a use tax because he bought the shoes online where there is no sales tax, but he lives in Winterfell. And in this example, this is just a sales tax because he lives in Winterfell and he bought the shoes in Winterfell. So I hope this example illustrates the difference between a sales tax and a use tax. So now, let's move on to an excise tax. What is an excise tax? An excise tax is similar to a sales tax. It's a tax imposed on the sale of goods, services, etc. So this is going to be hotel stays, uh, car rentals, uh, cigarettes, alcohol, uh, gasoline. So an excise tax is a tax much like a sales tax it's imposed on the sale of goods and services now a sales tax is only imposed on tangible goods right groceries shoes computers televisions gaming consoles whatever an excise tax is ex imposed on on both goods and services so the specific goods in this example cigarettes alcohol gasoline you know beer wine liquor uh, and also certain services like car rentals and hotel stays uh, can be imposed with a sales tax and can be extremely heavy. So when you're buying cigarettes, you could pay a sales tax of you know, 9% alongside an excise tax of whatever the excise tax might be. And these excise taxes tend to be heavier than a sales tax for specific reasons. Uh, the main difference between an excise tax and a sales tax is that the tax is imposed on quantity and not on price. So this is the main difference between a sales tax and an excise tax. A sales tax is imposed on price, right? You buy $100 worth of goods and you pay an X percent sales tax. An excise tax is imposed on quantity, meaning cartons of cigarettes or gallons of gasoline or days of car rental right it doesn't matter if you rent you know a budget car for sixty dollars a day or a you know a luxury car for five hundred dollars a day the excise tax applies to each day of that rental similarly it doesn't matter if you're buying some sort of crazy imported you know microbrewery beer or you're buying some you know natty light the excise tax is imposed on the unit like the bottles of beer that you buy or the gallons of gasoline that you buy you could buy you know super premium unleaded gasoline or go down and you know get the cheapest available gasoline that they have the excise tax would be the same because it would be on the gallons of gasoline you buy as opposed to the price you're paying overall when you're buying the gasoline now the key here is it can be imposed alongside the sales tax so you could have you know let's say you have X dollars per gallon gasoline tax and on top of that you pay you know like a nine percent sales tax so they could be in combination to each other they're not exclusive uh, and they can be extremely heavy 
mainly for two reasons. One is they're heavier taxes in order to discourage a certain type of behavior. So they don't want you smoking cigarettes because it's bad for your health. They don't want you to drink a lot of alcohol because it's bad for your health. And they also don't want you to, you know, drive gas guzzling vehicles because it's bad for the environment. Now you have the choice to do these things, but if you do do these things, they're going to hit you up with these very heavy excise taxes, right? So they're going to raise revenue from this undesirable behavior that you're engaging in. Uh, and also in the case of car rentals and hotel stays, the taxes are going to apply to people that are not going to be living in those areas. So they're not going to be applying to voters, right? That's a big deal. You don't want to upset your voters with the taxes that you put in place. So the people that are going to be staying in hotels or the people that are going to be renting cars are going to be people coming from outside of the area generally, right? People are going to land at the airport in Kansas City. They're going to rent a car. They're going to do their business in the state of Kansas or, you know, Missouri, and then they're going to fly out. These people are not native to the area. They're not going to be voting in the local elections. So, you know, they're not going to be pissed about the high car rental tax that they had to pay. Similarly, they're going to come, they're going to stay in a hotel, crazy excise taxes, but they're not going to be able to vote in the election. So, you know, there's primarily two reasons why the excise taxes are heavy. One, like I said, is to discourage certain set of behavior. And two is because it's not a tax that is applied to voters generally. So here's an example of an excise tax, right? This is from 2020. How high are beer taxes in your state? And like we said, this was a tax on the quantity of the goods sold. So in this case, it's a dollars per gallon tax, right? And in the state of Kansas, you can see it's an 18 cent per gallon tax on beer, whereas in you know the state of Missouri, it's a six cent per gallon tax on beer. Uh, Tennessee is the highest in the nation. It's a dollar 29 per gallon excise tax on beer and you know once again this is gallons of beer so if you buy a hundred gallons of beer you know you're gonna pay whatever the you know the, the the retail price of the beer is you're gonna pay a sales tax on top of that and also you're gonna pay you know 18 like 18 dollars for the the excise tax on the hundred gallons of beer that you buy in the state of Kansas so Excess taxes are going to be combined with sales taxes in that case. So that is basically what an excise tax is. Uh, you know, we talked about the consumption taxes, which were the sales tax, the use tax, and the excise tax. Now we're talking about state income taxes. So the vast majority of states have an income tax in place. Alaska, Washington, Nevada, Wyoming, South Dakota, Texas, and Florida have no income tax. Uh, the computation of the income that is taxed will vary by state, but many states start with federal adjusted gross income as a base, and then they make adjustments from that point on. Uh, so here is what individual income tax rates look like in different states, right? We said that certain states like Texas, Nevada, Washington, Wyoming, South Dakota, Florida don't have a personal income tax rate. And this is all for 2020. Uh, Kansas has a 5.7% personal income tax rate. Uh, Missouri has a 5.4% personal income tax rate, right? Minnesota has a very high income tax rate. California has a very high income tax rate, right? So much like you know what we talked about when we were talking about the income tax rates in cities this also might play a decision in where you want to locate after you graduate and have you know possibly multiple job offers from different locations right do you want to live in Kansas or do you want to live in Missouri if you have the option of working in Kansas City well I mean if you live in Missouri you'll be paying 0.3 percent less of a state income tax rate and it might not seem much but when you multiply it with your adjusted gross income, it could come out to be, you know, like a few hundred or maybe a few thousand dollars, right? Uh, do you want to live in Iowa or do you want to live in Illinois? Or, you know, I mean, these are all locations that are fairly close to each other, especially if you're, you know, in a clustered area like the Northeast. You have multiple locations that are very close to each other that have, you know, very different state income tax rates that 
would really, you know, influence how much money you have in your pocketbook once all the taxes are taken away. Uh, so get corporate tax rates, right? Once again, this is from 2020. You know, Kansas has a 7% corporate income tax rate. Missouri has a 4%. So if you are, you know, trying to start a business or if you're going to relocate your corporate headquarters, where do you want to put it, right? You would more likely put it in Missouri as opposed to Kansas City. Or would you put it in Illinois or Iowa, right? You'd probably put it in Illinois because it's going to be a 9.5% corporate income tax rate as opposed to a 12% income tax rate, which you have in Iowa. Right? Once again, if you're talking about areas that are fairly closely clustered together, right? are you going to put your corporate headquarters in New York State or Pennsylvania? You're probably going to put it in New York State because it's a 6.5% corporate income tax rate. Right? So taxes, you know, they permeate down into different levels of decision making. Where do I want to live? Where do I want to work? Where do I want my business to be located? So we talked about local taxes. We talked about state level taxes. Now let's talk about federal taxes. And federal taxes consist primarily of income taxes, right? And we'll talk about income taxes in greater detail much later. Uh, there's going to be chapters dedicated to it. Uh, we have payroll taxes, right? And payroll taxes we can split into two. We have employment taxes, which are earmarked. If you remember that term from the first half of the chapter, those are taxes that are dedicated to a specific purpose only. So these are earmarked to pay for Social Security and Medicare. These are based on annual wages paid to employees and net income earned by self-employed individuals. All right, so this is a tax that the employer pays. Your employer cuts this out of your paycheck and remits it to the federal government. It's not a tax that you pay personally it's much like the sales tax, right? You pay it to the person who's selling you the good, and then they pay it to the government on your behalf. This is similar. It is taken out of your paycheck by your employer, and then it is paid to the government in order to fund Social Security and Medicare. Unemployment taxes. Paid by <clears throat> employers based on annual compensation paid to workers and the size of the workforce. So these taxes pay for national unemployment insurance. So these taxes have actually become extremely relevant in the face of COVID, coronavirus. We also have federal excise taxes, which are not as prevalent or as relevant as the state level ones and then we have some miscellaneous other taxes like a wealth transfer tax right so primarily 
revenue for the federal government is generated by income taxes, payroll taxes, where federal excise taxes and other miscellaneous taxes make up a smaller portion. So here is a great example of this, right? This is the proposed federal budget for fiscal year 2021. And if you just Google this, you can actually find the document released by the White House. So this is the president's proposed budget for this upcoming fiscal year, right? So the projection is that we will generate three trillion eight hundred and sixty billion dollars of revenue and this pie chart is showing you where that revenue is expected to come from right so for fiscal year 2021 close to two billion dollars about fifty percent like right exactly fifty percent of the federal revenue is gonna come from individual income taxes so tax money that you and I pay is going to fund fifty percent of the government's operations for this upcoming fiscal year right a another large chunk of it thirty six percent is coming from payroll taxes right we talked about employment taxes that are earmarked to pay for Social Security and Medicare and we talked about the unemployment taxes that pays for unemployment insurance so one trillion three hundred and seventy three billion dollars so thirty six percent of the overall revenue for the government should be raised from payroll taxes one trillion nine hundred and twenty nine billion so fifty percent should be raised from the taxes that we pay on our income a much smaller portion is coming from corporate income taxes so 284 billion dollars seven percent of governmental revenue for fiscal year 2021 is coming from corporate income taxes and as you can see the other taxes are a much smaller percent right we have 87 billion dollars coming from federal excise taxes we have 22 billion dollars coming from estate and gift taxes which are those wealth transfer taxes that we talked about we have 54 billion dollars coming from custom duties uh, these are associated with trade uh, trading goods with foreign nations we have 71 billion dollars so two percent coming from earnings of the federal reserve and we have 40 billion dollars about one percent coming from other miscellaneous receipts so as you can see you know going back here the income taxes and the payroll taxes are the primary revenue drivers about 86 percent of the overall federal budget is coming from those two sources now one type of tax that is common to a lot of foreign governments but is not common to the US is a VAT a value-added tax right many foreign jurisdictions have the same type of taxes that we have in the United States so they have income taxes they have sales taxes they have excise taxes but one tax that is very common abroad that we don't have here in the US is the value-added tax <clears throat> and a value-added tax is a tax that is levied on firms engaged in any phase of the production of goods and the tax is based on the value added by the firm so in the production of a good you know there are multiple steps like if you buy shoes that shoe doesn't just appear out of a factory miraculously there's multiple steps that go into the construction of that shoe or similarly if you're buying you know a wooden table that table has multiple steps until it comes to you uh, the final consumer so a value-added tax just taxes each step of the production process and there are two primary methods of a value-added tax and we're going to talk about both of these one is the credit method 
and the other is the subtraction method. So here we have an example, right? We have a table being sold to a customer for $250. But as I said, that table doesn't just miraculously appear, right? There are multiple steps in the manufacturing process. First, we have a timber farmer that harvests the wood and sells it to the furniture maker. Then the furniture maker takes that raw wood and constructs it into a table and sells it to a wholesaler. Then the wholesaler sells the table to a retailer who then sells it to the consumer, right? In the US, if we have this process, no one is paying a tax up until the very last point, right? Because none of these, we, you know, like I said, a sales tax is a, is a tax at the point of sale. So it is the final thing that is important uh, for a sales tax. So in this case, it doesn't matter what's happening here or at, you know, at, at this step or at this step or at this step. The only thing that matters is what is happening at the final step. So under a 10% sales tax, you have a $250 table. You have a 10% sales tax. That means this has a $25 sales tax. So that means, you know, $275 is what you as the customer would pay. So you would pay a $25 sales tax on this, right? Now, if we're talking about a VAT, here's how this works, right? And we said there's two methods of this. One is the subtraction method. So we're going to do the subtraction method first. With the subtraction method, you pay a tax, first of all, with a VAT, a tax is paid at each step of the process, right? Whether it's a subtraction method or a credit invoice method. With a subtraction method, you look at the value added and you pay a tax on that value. So if there's a $10 tax at this step of the process, you know, you assume the raw wood has a value of zero and you sold it for $40. So 40 minus zero is 40. So at this step, you added $40 of value to this. So 40 times 10%. At this step of the process, this guy, the timber farmer, would pay a $4 VAT. The next step of the process, the furniture maker, he sells the table to the wholesaler for 100 bucks. He bought the lumber for 40 bucks, so he added 60 bucks of value. He would pay a tax of six dollars. Right? The wholesaler bought the table for 100, sold it to the retailer for 150. So he added $50 of value. $50 times 10% is going to be a $5 VAT. So at this step, the wholesaler is paying a $5 value added tax. And finally, the retailer sold for $250 but bought for $150. That means the retailer added $100 worth of value. And of that $100, he would pay, whoops, once again, a 10% VAT. That means he would pay a $10 VAT. And the customer wouldn't pay anything. The customer would just pay the $250 for the table. So at the end of the day, 10 plus 5 is 15, plus 6 is 21, plus 4, you still have $25 of value-added tax that was paid to the government, right? Similar to the $25 sales tax that was paid to the government here. The only difference is with the sales tax, we as the consumer are paying that at the point of sale. With a value-added tax, the producers are paying at each step. So this was the subtraction method, right? Now let's look at what happens with the credit invoice method. The credit invoice method works this way. So the farmer, once again, sells this for 40, right? He 
bought this for zero so the value that he added to this was forty dollars previously so the value uh, let's do this 10% VAT uh, hold on let's do this value that credit and net VAT okay so the value of this was forty dollars the value added tax on this of 10% is going to be $4, right? 40 times 10% is $4. Since there were no previous steps in this process, the credit is zero, so the net value added tax here is $4, right? The timber farmer pays $4, gets $0 of credit back. He has a net value added tax paid of $4. The furniture maker sells it for $100. He pays a value added tax of $10 because 100 times 10% is 10. In the previous step there was a VAT oh sorry in the previous step there was a VAT that was paid of $4 so he is gonna get a credit for that VAT paid and he's only gonna pay six dollars net so ten dollars is going out of his pocket he's getting four dollars back from the government the net VAT is gonna be six bucks the value for the wholesaler is hundred and fifty dollars a ten percent VAT is going to be fifteen dollars previously there was a ten dollar VAT that was paid so the wholesaler is gonna get a credit of ten dollars the net VAT is gonna be five dollars and then the retailer Similarly, 250, 10% of that is 25. He's going to get a credit for $15, and the net VAT is going to be $10. So similar to the previous case, we have $10 plus 5 is 15, plus 6 is 21, plus 4 is 25. So overall, we have a VAT that was paid of $25, right? Similar to the subtraction method, also similar to the sales tax that we paid here. The only difference is with a VAT, we pay at each step of the process. So very quickly, at the end of the chapter, we're gonna talk about different sources of tax law. So the body of tax law is generated by all three branches of the government. So we have the legislative branch, which has authority to the in, through the internal revenue code they have the ability to make new laws the executive branch has administrative authority through income tax regulations through revenue rulings through revenue proceedings and through letter rulings and judicial branch has judicial authority through courts, right? So the legislative branch has statutory authority, so the authority to make laws through the Internal Revenue Code. The executive branch has administrative authority through these different mechanisms, and the judicial branch has judicial authority through the courts. So the Internal Revenue Code is where we get the statutory authority from. It was codified in 1939 by compiling all previous revenue statutes. Uh, it's codified in 1954 again and most recently in 1986. And it has you know, provisions, rules regarding all sorts of different taxes. So Treasury Regulations 
are to interpret and provide guidance on rules in the Internal Revenue Code. So these are not laws, right? The Internal Revenue Code, this is the law. Treasury regulations just help you interpret and, and provide you guidance regarding the laws, right? So these interpretations uh, can be uh, legislative, meaning they can provide operational rules for a specific code section can be interpretive meaning that it can help explain the IRS's position on various Internal Revenue Code sections and it can be procedural meaning that they can address procedural matters such as how to file a tax. Right, so what we get from the Treasury regulations can be legislative, they can be interpretive, or they can be procedural. But once again, Treasury regulations are not law. They only help us interpret the law which is set by the Internal Revenue Code. So there's different levels of Treasury regulations, right? We have proposed Treasury regulations, which provide insight into how IRS is interpreting the law and allow practitioners to have input into the rulemaking process. And they cannot rely on, so the taxpayers cannot rely on proposed regulations to support tax positions for planning purposes unless the IRS clearly states otherwise. So these are on the onset. These are proposed, meaning that they're not law yet, and you can't really rely on this for credible guidance. This is just out there so that you as a practicing accountant can provide your thoughts into the lawmaking process. Then we have temporary treasury regulations which provide guidance until final regulations are adopted. Uh, they are valid for no more than three years from the date of issue and these have the same authority as a final regulation. So you can use temporary regulations as some sort of guidance or an interpretation of the law. And then the final stage of Treasury regulations interpret an Internal Revenue Code section and provide guidance for tax compliance and planning purposes. And this is the highest authority by the Treasury Department. So once again, the Internal Revenue Code is the law and Treasury regulations help us interpret the law. All right. Then we have different administrative pronouncements. These are issued by the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, which is a subdivision of the Treasury Department. Uh, so a revenue ruling is when IRS indicates the tax consequences of specific transactions in practice. How does the IRS apply tax law to a particular set of facts? So revenue rulings help taxpayers get into the mind of the IRS. You know, if we have a certain set of tax, a certain set of uh, facts, a certain set of tax data, uh, what would the IRS do with this? So revenue rulings kind of help taxpayers wrap their mind around that. Revenue procedures deal with the procedural 
aspects of tax practice. How to comply with IRS's administrative matters. So this more has to do with, you know, as, as it's implied, in the administrative side of things, like how do you pay a certain tax? How do you file these certain documents? The revenue ruling has to do with how do you apply certain rules? What would the IRS do in this situation? So on and so forth. So both of these are published in internal revenue bulletins and compiled annually in cumulative bulletins that you can find on the IRS's website. Uh, so another type of an administrative pronouncement is the letter ruling. And this is different from the revenue ruling or the revenue procedure because this is initiated by a taxpayer who asks the IRS to explain a specific tax circumstance. So this is different from the previous two. The previous two, the IRS just talks about because they think it's a hot button issue or something that's been causing them problems. But this one is actually triggered by a taxpayer. And this is triggered by sending in a, you know, a technical letter. You draft a letter with the help of a tax attorney or a tax accountant and you also pay a fee to the IRS to have them answer this letter for you. Uh, so it can cost anywhere from 250 to 50,000, right? Depending on the complexity of the tax issue that you're asking guidance about, the IRS can charge you anywhere from 250 to 50,000. And only applicable to the taxpayer that requested the letter ruling publicly available on IRS's website. So you as a business owner have a specific tax question that you want to ask the IRS. You draft a letter explaining your circumstance. You pay whatever the IRS is, is deemed to be appropriate for this answer. And then you get a response back from the IRS. Now I could have an identical tax situation, but your letter doesn't necessarily apply to my case, right? You could, use, you could use your letter in a court of law to say, hey, I asked the IRS and they said this was the proper tax treatment if you know the IRS decides to audit you anyway. But I could not use your letter even if my circumstance, my question was identical. So we talked about the Internal Revenue Code, which is you know the legislative branch's authority, statutory authority. We talked about different rulings and pronouncements, which is the executive branch's administrative authority. And now we're going to talk about the judicial branch's authority through the court system, right? This is, uh, generally speaking, the structure of the U.S. court system, right? We have the Supreme Court, which is the top of the chain. Then we have the Court of Appeals at the regional circuit and the federal circuit. Under the regional Court of Appeals, we have the U.S. Tax Court and the U.S. District Courts. Under the Tax Court, we have small cases divisions. And then the Federal Circuit of the U.S. Court of Appeals has the U.S. Court of Federal Claims underneath it. So these courts at this level have more authority than the courts at the trial level, right? So appellate courts have more authority than trial courts. Uh, generally, you'll have a result at a trial court if you're happy with that result, fine. If you're not happy with that result, you can escalate it and appeal it at either the Court of Appeals, Regional Circuit, or Court of Appeals, Federal Circuit. 
and at that point if you're not happy with that outcome then you might be able to appeal it at the Supreme Court right the Supreme Court decides which cases it's going to hear but if you get an appeal from the US, you know the US Court of Appeals whether it's the regional circuit or the federal circuit that has more authority than a ruling coming out of any of the trial courts so this is uh, what the geographic boundaries of the appeals and district courts look like right so we are in this district right here in the state of Kansas in you know region 10 so if we go back to this slide our regional circuit is going to be right here and these are where we have some tax courts so the closest one to us is going to be in Kansas City or we also have one in Wichita where they will hear small tax cases right so do we go to a district court or a tax court if you have a tax matter that you want to argue in court would you take it to a district court or a tax court well one thing to consider is if it's a very technical tax issue or not because tax court judges have tax expertise uh, district courts judges are not tax experts right so if you have a very technical issue that you think you are correct in it might be to your benefit to take it to a tax court as opposed to a district court now the problem is there is no jury here and there is a jury here right and there are certain benefits to a jury trial right if you get the jury on your side and you present compelling evidence then you might get a not guilty verdict from the jury right so this is one thing to consider and then the other thing to consider is whether or not the tax has been paid but right? if you've already paid the tax and then you want to contest it then that leads you down a certain path if the tax has not been paid you cannot take your case to the district court you cannot have a jury trial so you can only take your course to the district court and have a jury trial if you've in fact paid the tax right so the IRS has forced you to pay a tax you don't believe you paid the proper amount you believe you should have paid much less uh, if you've paid the tax then you can go to a district court but if you haven't paid the tax yet and you want to argue it in court then you can only take it to a tax court uh, yeah and one thing to consider is prior outcomes for cases in your district do matter so if you go back here right if you're taking if you're going to court in the 10th district then you might want to see if there are favorable rulings that are similar to your case that you can use to help you at the 10th district right so that does matter so the Supreme Court like we said is the mandatory authority in all courts it is the highest court so anything the Supreme Court says is the rule of law at any level below it the US Court of Appeals is mandatory on district courts and other lower courts within the circuit pervasive authority in other circuits so if you go back here if you get a favorable ruling here right it's going to be mandatory for anything underneath it and it also might hold up in other districts so if you get a ruling in district 10 it might hold up in district 8 it might hold up in district 5 but it you know it doesn't necessarily mean that it will hold up in those districts but it does mean that it'll apply to all other cases that are happening in district 10 that are similar uh, 
Anything that comes out from the U.S. tax court is not mandatory. So that's basically chapter one, right? We talked about quite a bit. This was an introduction to the course. Uh, and I think at this point you would have enough to uh, take the first quiz. So if you were to just pop your syllabus open, let me see if I can access it through here. Uh, yeah, let's open the syllabus, right? If you were to be following the stated timeline that I've laid out here, 824 should have been the first video. I mean, you can do this on your own time, obviously, but this should be video one. This should be video two. So I will give you until a week from 826 to do the first quiz, which a week from 826 is going to be uh, the first Wednesday of September. So 9-2 is going to be the due date for quiz one. Uh, you will only have one attempt to do quiz one, and it's going to be a straight shot thing, right? So once you start it, I think you'll have like an hour to finish it, and you'll only have one attempt, but you do have until the 2nd of September midnight to start it. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll see you again in the third video.